Um, today we're talking about Brad's latest book. Uh, which is a book on really the way I think about it is it's it's the book on the Declaration of Independence, but its its title is America's Revolutionary Mind, and I want to ask you about that in a minute uh, about the title. Um, so yeah, let's start with that actually. So first, how are you doing, Pat? <laughs> I'm going on and on. I'm doing fine. Uh, your audience probably doesn't know we've had some technical difficulties making this happen, but. <clears throat> You're in Puerto Rico, I'm in Clemson, South Carolina, and I think we're going to make this work. So, Brett, what do you mean by America's mind? That is, what is what does it mean to say America's revolutionary mind um, and, and to assign a mind in a sense to America? Yeah, so I got the idea for the title from a famous letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote to Henry Lee in 1825, just before he died, in which he described the Declaration of Independence and its purpose uh, as an expression of the American mind. <clears throat> and I think that's right. I think the Declaration is an expression of the American mind. It sums up the fundamental core moral and political principles on which this country was founded. But you'll note that I did not title the book The American Mind. It's America's revolutionary mind. So I was trying to be more intentional and focus uh, on the ideas of the American Revolution per se. So, I mean, because if it were a book on the American mind, then it would have to be a book that takes up all kinds of issues about which I was not interested. It would have to take up issues and questions with regard to culture, um, you know, American views on all kinds of issues, on marriage, on religion, uh, on food, you know, you name it. I wanted to limit the focus of the book to essentially both the causes and meaning of the American Revolution. So that's the American, uh, America's revolutionary mind part of the title. Now, the second part of the title, after the colon, is uh, a moral history of the American Revolution and the declaration that defined it. So first, let's parse American Revolution and declaration. So initially, when I began to write the book, the idea was to write a book just on the Declaration of Independence. That was, that was the goal. The idea was to write a relatively short book on the moral political philosophy of the Declaration. But very quickly, um, maybe a month into the writing of the book, uh, I read a, another famous uh, letter, this time from John Adams to Thomas Jefferson, in which Adams described the American Revolution not as the war, but rather as a revolution in the minds of the American people. And that revolution, he said, took place in the 15 years before shots were fired at Lexington and Concord in 1775. So that really, that was the tripwire, the intellectual tripwire for me when I realized that there was something much bigger, much deeper uh, than what historians had previously told us about the American Revolution. Right? It was a revolution in the minds uh, of the American people, and that revolution was a moral revolution. And Adams uh, equates that moral revolution with the Americans' um, understanding of the doctrine of individual rights. Now, let me add one other quotation that I read at almost the same time that I think really sums up what Adams is saying. And that was a quote, that was something I read in a letter from Tom Paine to the Abbe Mabli, in which Tom Paine said of the American Revolution that we see with new eyes, hear with new ears, and think new thoughts, right? So the idea is that there was a, a revolution of ideas. And Paine likewise, in addition to Adams, says that this moral revolution was directly connected to the Americans' understanding of the nature of rights. Uh, so that was the moment when the book went from being something about just the Declaration of Independence to really being a book about the entire revolutionary period. And, that, and so what I do is I use the Declaration of Independence as a kind of ideological roadmap mm -hmm. by which to understand the revolution as a whole. Uh, so 
the book, I'll, let me mention that the, the, what I do is I take the declarations for self-evident truths, which can be summed up in one word each, equality, rights, consent, and revolution. Mm -hmm. And I devote two, two chapters to each. to each of the self-evident truths. And then what I do is I provide a kind of intellectual history going back to the late 17th century, usually beginning with John Locke, and then trace how colonial Americans understood and transformed the ideas uh, of the Declaration, equality, rights, consent, and revolution. Uh, and then, but most of the book though is focused on the 1760s and 1770s during the so-called years of the imperial crisis. So it's a kind of, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of comprehensive intellectual history of the revolution as a whole. So uh, Tom reminds us, I didn't, I didn't realize this, I don't know if you did, that today's Patriot's Day. Um, so yeah, I didn't know there was a Patriot's Day and here yeah. it is, it's today. And really it's amazingly fitting because, you know, if you think about where we are today politically, and I don't want to get too much into this, but, but really, you know, we're, we've got political parties that are basically both reverted to tribalism both uh, uh, explicitly and certainly implicitly for decades now have rejected the very founding principles of this country. We're in the middle of this unbelievable mess, which is the, you know, this Corona mess. Uh, but we're in this unbelievable political mess where the, both political parties have completely rejected these principles. So I can't think of a period in American history where this book is more important, would be more important than right now. When, when these ideas are being lost, these are being, ideas are being forgotten. Ideas are being forgotten even by the people who supposedly are trying to preserve them, conservatives, right? The, we've got now national conservatives and this kind of conservative and that kind of conservative. All I would sum up as anti-American conservatives because they've abandoned these ideas. And I think what Brad's book is doing is it's, it's reminding us of these ideas and then digging deep into their origin and into their philosophical foundations to really help us lay a foundation for a new American revolution because nothing short of a new American revolution I've come to believe is going to, is going to save us from, uh, from the continued decline of this country. So, so let's delve into this because, um, because I think this stuff is really, really, really important. And, and uh, so chapter one, um, and I don't intend to go by chapter, but chapter one I think is really important because it lays kind of the intellectual foundations for everything else because the, 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 I mean, the founding of America is kind of the crowning achievement in the enlightenment. And you have to understand the enlightenment to understand the founding and the declaration. And what you do here is you lay down kind of the philosophical highlights and the essential characteristics of what the enlightenment is. So, so tell us about what are the ideas that are at the heart and at the core of the enlightenment that then uh, in a sense made real politically at least, because I think in other aspects they're made real earlier, but politically they're made real with the founding of America. I'd say the key concept of the Enlightenment is the idea of the laws of nature uh, and the rights of nature. So in other words, it's a rediscovery of nature. Um, uh, speaking metaphorically, it's the rediscovery of the book of nature, which is now to be read through what uh, 17th century philosophers called right reason. So it's both uh, metaphysical and epistemological. The rediscovery of really both of the idea of nature, that nature is governed by certain causal laws that can be discovered and understood by human reason. And the three principal philosophers, I'd say of the 17th century uh, English Enlightenment were, um, were Bacon, Newton, and Locke. Uh, Bacon's, uh, uh, his Novum Organum, which established a kind of intellectual or inductive mode of reasoning for, for reading and, and interpreting the book of nature. Newton's Principia Mathematica, which, which laid out the scientific laws of nature. And then uh, two books by, by John Locke. The first was his essay concerning human understanding, 
uh, which laid out a kind of empirical inductive mode of reasoning. It said that reason is uh, efficacious. Reason can can understood can understand uh, relations of cause and effect, not just in nature, but also in human nature and in human action. And then, along with the ethic concerning human understanding, I would add the most famous book uh, of the American Revolution, which was Locke's Second Treatise of Government, which established the idea of rights that the perp and that the purpose of government was the protection of rights, and it established kind of a limited uh, form of government which had at its heart the idea of individual self-ownership and self-governance, right? So Locke's great contribution, intellectual contribution to the revolution, I would say, is the rediscovery of the individual, the individual who is self-owning and self-governing, self-reliant, and, and, and is the, the master of, of his own life and, and of his future. But narrowing it down, I would say that the single most important thing that comes out of the Enlightenment for colonial America is the idea that the so-called that the so-called laws of nature can actually be applied not just to nature out there, not just to planetary motion, but it can also be applied to the human condition, to human life, to um, uh, to human nature. And so you, you get primarily, I would say, beginning with Locke and his ethic concerning human understanding, an attempt to establish a demonstrative science of ethics, which he said should be as certain as mathematics. So it's, it's taking, in other words, the methodology, uh, the modes of reasoning that Newton used and applied to discovering the scientific laws of nature to trying to discover certain moral laws and rights of nature. And I'd say that's the single most important contribution of the Enlightenment to the American Revolution, which then, as it's, tra as it's uh, transported to America beginning in the 1730s and 1740s, Bacon, Newton, and Locke are being taught in America's universities uh, for the first time. And take the case of John Adams, for instance. Uh, when Adams was an undergraduate at Harvard College, uh, that's where he was first introduced to these great thinkers. And you can, you can see Adams in his diary as a 20-year-old trying himself to apply Newton's methodology to discovering moral laws of nature. And he, he, he does it in three ways. First is extrospection. You know, you look out into the world and you observe human nature human action and human interaction. And from that, you, you, you try to discover the underlying causes of certain forms of human action. Uh, and then you, it, it, from that, you can induce, Adams argued, as a 20-year-old, yeah. you can induce certain moral principles that, <clears throat> that will guide man uh, towards a, a, flourishing, a flourishing kind of life. And then from there, then it's a very short step to uh, applying that methodology and the idea of a demonstrative science of ethics uh, to the idea of rights. And that really is the first uh, division between American colonials and British imperial officials uh, in 1765 with the passage of the Stamp Act. Yeah. So it's interesting. I mean, three of the four books you mentioned are really books in epistemology. Right. And, and, and it, right. right. I mean, the way I always put it is the great achievement in the Leibniz, not me. I mean, Ayn Rand and others have put it is, is the, in a sense, the rediscovery of the efficacy of reason um, and the, and the application of reason to discovery, the laws of nature and the laws of man. And, um, and then, you know, and then its application to morality is as incomplete as maybe they applied it, but they were on the right path that it was in the right direction that they were trying to do it. Um, so how do you get from there, from you've got this idea of reason and you've got applying reason to morality, how do you get from there to the declaration? All right, so that's, that's a long story. <laughs> that's a big uh, question. About, about four, but make it short, a big question <laughs> short I, version. Yeah, it's a big question. I have about 400 pages uh, yeah, I know. On, on, that, on that question, yeah. So, you know, what I would say is the, 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 the crucial moment 
uh, in the coming of the American Revolution was 1765, when um, British, the British Parliament uh, passed the so-called Stamp Act, uh, which for the first time in colonial history imposed the tax um, on the Americans without any kind of representation, hence the famous slogan, no taxation without representation. But this, this was a crucial turning point. Let me just put this in context, because you have to understand that for the previous 40 years or so, the British policy toward the American uh, colonies was what they called salutary neglect. It was a, it was a kind of laissez-faire policy, a hands-off policy. And during those years from a, approximately 1720, let's say, to the early 1760s, the Americans were basically left alone to govern themselves without any British interference at all. But then in 1756, Britain engages in the so-called French and Indian War, the Seven Years' War, uh, against France, uh, which they won. And in 1763, uh, with the Treaty of Paris, it's as though Great Britain woke up and remembered that they had these colonies and they tried to reassert both political and economic control over their colonies. And the laws that were passed during the 1760s, the Sugar Act, Stamp Act, Declaratory and Townsend Acts, were, you, you might say it was an attempt by British imperial officials to superimpose the British deep state on American political life. So they shipped over hundreds, if not thousands of tax collectors and administrators. And most importantly, they sent the British Navy and the British Army. So now all of a sudden in 1764, 1765, the Americans look around them and they see all kinds, uh, they, they see an expanded British state in the colonies, and then all of a sudden they're passing these laws. So I would say that, the, the, as I mentioned, the crucial moment was 1765 with the passage of the Stamp Act, which caused the Americans to reconsider not just their relationship with Great Britain, but the, the two most core principles that tied the colonies together with the mother country. And that was first, their understanding of rights, and secondly, their understanding of the Constitution. So let's start with the Constitution. Up until 1765, virtually all colonial Americans were fans of the British Constitution. They called it repeatedly the greatest constitution in the history of the world. Mm -hmm. But they realized now with the passage of the Stamp Act that there was one major problem with the British constitution, which of course, you know, there is no, right? So um, somewhere here, I've got my, my I'll show your audience. I've got my handy pocket constitution with me, right? So I can pull this constitution out of my breast or back pocket and if Britain passes the Stamp Act, I can turn to the relevant passage in my constitution and say, ah, here, here's why the Stamp Act is a violation of the constitution. Yep. But the problem, of course, is that they couldn't do that because there was no British constitution as a written document. The British mm -hmm. constitution at the time was simply an assemblage, a collection of common and statutory laws uh, and, and customs and the form of government uh, of the British government at any moment in time, which had always been evolving. So in other words, the British constitution was always evol evolving. There was, in other words, there was no there there. And so with regard to the Stamp Act, British imperial officials argued that the Stamp Act was legal and therefore unconstitutional. Or, no sorry, constitution. it was legal yeah, it, it was it was legal and therefore constitutional. The Americans, by contrast, argued that the Stamp Act was unjust and therefore unconstitutional. Right. So that then what, what the, that raises the question: Why was it? Why was the Stamp Act, from the American perspective, unjust? Well, it was unjust because it violated their rights, and this takes us to the next major moral concept that's really at the heart and soul. Uh, of the American Revolution, and that's the idea of rights. So 
colonial Americans up until 1765 were advocates of the so-called rights of Englishmen, mm -hmm. right? All Englishmen were, were proponents of the so-called uh, rights of Englishmen. And England was, after all, at that time, the freest nation in the history of the world, right? Yep. And they gloried in their rights as Englishmen. But then they came to understand that there's a problem and the, with that notion of the rights of Englishmen. The rights of Englishmen is a doctrine which says there are rights of a particular people at a particular place at a particular time. And those rights are always changing and evolving. And in the same way that the Americans would come to look for the idea or develop the idea of a written constitution as fundamental law, they also came to ground that they wanted to ground their constitution on the on an idea of rights that would be permanent and unmovable, right? And that foundation, of course, was nature. So they were looking for rights that are grounded in the nature of man, rights that would be absolute, certain, permanent, and universal. And that was the critical moment, uh, in my view, in, dur in uh, or during the imperial crisis, when the Americans developed this and, and really filled out this new idea of what at the time they called natural rights, the idea that there are rights of nature or rights of human nature. So, so let's, um, I, I want to get into what they meant by rights and, and how they define rights, but, but let's kind of follow your outline a little bit. And, and I want to, you know, there's always this question in my mind, this idea of self-evident truths, right? When you read it, you go, <laughs> you know, particularly in the world we live in today, none of this is self-evident, right? I mean, nobody gets it. Nobody gets it, particularly now. Um, what did they mean by, by self-evident? Was, what was the context for them to talk about self-evident truths in the context of the Declaration? Right. So I developed uh, this idea in, in a chapter devoted to the seven words uh, that open the second sentence of the Declaration, which are, uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident, which I think are the most important, if not the most beautiful words in the American lexicon. So, but it's, it's also the most, it's the most complex chapter of the entire book philosophically. Um, and and it was complex because at the time there was a very philosophically technical understanding or definition of what self-evidence meant. And a self-evident truth was a truth where the proposition, uh, it was a proposition whose subject and predicate uh, necessarily related to one, uh, one another without contradiction. It has to be perceptually self-evident. So examples uh, would be up is not down, black is not white, in is not out, right? Something that's immediately perceptually obvious, self-evident to you. But here's the problem. If you think about it in the context of the Declaration of Independence, that doesn't quite hold, right? So the Declaration, after uh, the opening clause, we hold these truths to be self-evident, then lays out four truths which are said to be self-evident, right? That all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, among which other rights, the life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Uh, and then the fourth truth, uh, which let me just, for the, per for the sake of your audience, let me just, I, I haven't quite memorized it. It says that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, that fourth self-evident truth and the third self-evident truth are not self-evident. Well, They're not self-evident. But even the first one is not, given... G given slavery, it certainly is not self-evident. Well, it, 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 could, it could be potentially self-evident if understood philosophically, right? If you just take the idea, all men are created equal, right? You can interpret that 
in such a way that it kind of sort of comes close to being a self-evident truth. The second is much more is is much further away from the the, the strict technical definition of self-evidency, and the third and fourth clearly are not self-evident. So yeah. the question is is this? I mean, the, the 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 question that I really spent a lot of time thinking very hard about is well, what did the founders mean by self-evident? Well, it's also important to understand and most scholars of the Declaration of Independence forget and don't, they, they, everybody focuses on self-evident. Nobody until my book, until the chapter in my book on self-evident truths has focused on the idea of truth, yeah. right? What did they mean, which I think is the much more important concept. Sure, sure. What did they mean, what, what did they mean by truth? And, and it's important, particularly in the context of the world in which we live today, because it is said, as you know, that we live in a post-truth society, Yep. right? The founders, the founding generation had a completely different understanding of what truth is. Truth denotes a relationship between, uh, between uh, uh, an idea in the mind and, and, and objective reality. Uh, and that meant that truth, was, th- th- they believed in the possibility of truth that was objective, absolute, certain, permanent, and universal. That's mm-hmm. the first thing to say, which means then that the principles that they are establishing in the Declaration of Independence are not principles that would have been true only for 1776, but not in 1876 or in 1776 or in 21st century America. Yep. They believe that their truths were true, period, right? All right, now, we hold these truths to be self-evident. I mean, if you just parse the words of the sentence, it's, this is a, a fascinating problem. Well, who is the we, right? Is it Thomas Jefferson? And the other four committees, um, the, the other four committee members who drafted the declaration, including uh, John Adams and Benjamin Franklin, did it mean the Continental Congress, which signed the declaration? Did it mean all of the American people? Right. So then you ask the question, well, how could these truths be self-evident to all people? Mm-hmm. And then what does it mean to hold? these truths. So, right, so uh, I don't want to go too far into the weeds on this, sure. but here, here's, my, here's, my, here's my, my bottom line position, is that <clears throat> the Ameri- American revolutionaries expanded the original understanding and definition of what self-evidency was. And what they argued was, you, you begin with a foundational, even self-evident truth, from which then you can carry forward with that core idea uh, deductively uh, principles which naturally issue from the core fundamental truth. Uh, And so the four truths all work together logically, right? From equality to the revolution truth. They are all the second, third, and fourth truths yeah, follow logically from from the first one, and I think and I think what ultimately what Jefferson was saying in the Declaration, when he said we hold these truths to be self evident. I, I mean, I think those truths, self evident truths, were self evident to, to Thomas Jefferson and John Adams before they became self evident to ordinary everyday Americans. Mm-hmm. But once those truths had been discovered and stated as they are in the Declaration of Independence, then they can become self-evident to those who then read those truths. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning, any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world 
to the dark ages and to the role of the collectivist brute. Using the super chat, and I noticed yesterday when I appealed for uh, support for the show, many of you stepped forward and actually uh, supported the show for the first time. So I'll do it again. Maybe we'll get some more today. Um, if you like what you're hearing, if you appreciate what I'm doing, then I appreciate your support. Uh, those of you who don't yet support the show, please take this opportunity. Go to yourronbrookshow.com slash support or go to subscribestar.com, your own book show, and, um, and, and make a kind of a monthly contribution uh, to, keep this, uh, to keep this going. I'm not sure when the next...